Hello and welcome to NJ Biz Conversations. I'm your host, Jeff Kanaj. My guest today is Kathy Bennett. She is the president and CEO of the New Jersey Hospital Association. Kathy, welcome. Hello. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you taking the time. Now, now I, I, uh, the, your, your organization represents 108 hospitals throughout the state. Have I, have I got that right? That's right. Okay. So, and, and that's most of them, <laughs> the overwhelming majority of them obviously. So I wanted to start by getting a read on where they are now, where where the hospitals, New Jersey hospitals are in what I think most people now consider the post-COVID era. Um, do hospital executives, do industry leaders like you and, and your members, do they see themselves as being in the post-COVID era? And, and if so, what does that mean in terms of how they're going to proceed um, going forward? Sure. Great question, because as you know, New Jersey is being one of the hotspots of COVID back in right. 2020. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really it took a pummeling from this, but we definitely turned the corner. We're in the post-COVID era. And what that means is that we do a lot of monitoring of what's taking place. We're watching the variants and we make sure that we're communicating and offering opportunities to patients and to residents of our communities to get tested, to get vaccinated, um, and also to raise awareness of other you know, COVID and flu-like sort of uh, illnesses. Sure. Right. And and I, I, I mean, I ask that in part because there have been stories recently, one in the New York Times, I believe it was yesterday, um, talking about how there has been an uptick in, in, in COVID cases and, again, talking about wearing masks again. So it's, it's interesting to hear that, that, uh, that, that, that they're still dealing that, with that. And also, the, when I talk to, to hospital executives, I hear a couple of things that sort of related to, to, to COVID and, and, the af and particularly the aftermath of the pandemic. One is sorting through the kinds of changes that they did, that they made, in part with technology and other things during the pandemic, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, are you are you hearing that? Is that is that something that, uh, that that's that's taking some time at this point? Oh, that absolutely is taking place. As you know, you know, with hospitals like with other industries, you really had to reinvent and do it quickly. Exactly. Uh, right. One of our hospital execs said, "You know, we're building the plane while we're flying it," and it's true. That's exactly what was taking place. Now we had this moment to reflect. We're thinking about what worked really well, what sort of things we want to accelerate. You know, so we saw a really great uptick on you know telehealth. We right. saw you know a lot of you know creativity that allowed us to surge up and meet the need for hospital beds and hospital care by all residents of New Jersey. And so those great lessons that are built to you know being what we call a high reliability organization. That's where all members of a team, not just specific individuals, know what's happening with patients, understand that they have a role in helping you know, the patient get back to a really great state of health. All that is taking place and being baked into what these models of care look like. Okay, and and the other the other uh, issue that I hear over and over again is challenges with staffing. Um, obviously, as you mentioned at the top, COVID was a was a, a, a hit very hard in, in New Jersey. Hospitals suffered a lot of burnout um, from from staff members. Um, I heard all sorts of stories um, about folks leaving. That, in addition to just the the sort of normal everyday staffing challenges that that, that hospitals have, first of all, um, how is that going now? Has that eased up at all? The, the uh, particularly with with nurses, um, although across the board, um, or or are hospitals still challenged by by trying to to to, to maintain attract and retain talented people? I think hospitals, just like all industries, you know, saw that same challenge of you know staffing. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it was, you know, that term quiet quitting that sure. emerged, um, you know, during, you know, COVID and as we moved into this post-COVID era, or, you know, people really rethinking that work-life balance. And so what we've really seen our hospitals do is lean in to address what the needs are of all of their team members, you know, the clinicians, the physicians, the nurses, our dietitians, you know, and then also, you know, when you talk about the environmentalists, you know, the folks that were in there cleaning the facility every day during COVID, those right. helping prepare and deliver food. So this is a very, you know, significant issue. And so they made a lot of investments into, you know, the resilience or to the well-being emotionally and mentally of their team members, not just the physical health. And you've seen that sort of spread into other areas where our hospitals are now, they've learned lessons and those lessons are you know, flowing through and they're making them available to other businesses. 
Okay. And uh, related to that, and again, it goes back, uh, unfortunately, to, to the pandemic and some of the changes, particularly with technology. I'm wondering if um, hospitals are looking for different kinds of skills, different kinds of education, different kinds of backgrounds now that they're, now technology has gotten more prevalent, more, um, and, and it's more, more used more widely in a variety of different contexts. And also, so just the, the sort of again the different the, the different um, mindset about about what might be what might be happening what what do we need to do during the next pandemic has the, has that complicated the task at all? I don't think it's really complicated. I think it's opened a lot of doors. Okay. You know, New Jersey's healthcare you know high, you know has you know, our hospitals you know employ directly and indirectly about three hundred and fifty five thousand individuals. Great, well paying jobs. And what we learned from the pandemic was that you know. You know, virtual technology has a significant role. The wearing of mobile devices, being able to deliver telehealth and meeting people where they're at, those really changed, you know, sort of what we're going to need. And I can't imagine any major in, in college, any student coming out of high school that can't find a place and a healthcare role for the future. And so as we look at it, we know that, of course, you're going to see the importance of AI and health informatics. For sure. But you're also seeing some really neat things emerge. You know, as we look at, for example, nutrition, you're hearing more and more of our hospitals looking at what's the type of food we provide within our hospitals. And you're seeing changes to the menus. You're seeing a greater emphasis on, you know, being green and, you know, changing the footprint of the facility and what they do and what the output into a community is. In addition to that, we see things like, um, you know, even 3D printing for limbs and for, you know, shoulder replacements, or hip replacements, so really personalized medicine. So a lot of different, you know, I think opportunities are evolving. And so for any student, you know, I think that there's a great opportunity to be part of what is going to be probably the largest, you know, availability of jobs between now and 2030, and that's in healthcare. Okay. And uh, uh, again, not, not, Quite related, but maybe um, the the issue of, of inequality of outcomes um, was an issue before the pandemic. The pandemic sort of exacerbated it, highlighted it, uh, highlighted the problem, made it clear that that there there really is something wrong here <laughs> that has to be fixed. I know Bob Garrett at, at Hackensack Meridian. I've talked to him. But it's a it's a big issue for him. It's a big part of what what he's doing. What progress do you see generally along those lines, if any? So I think there's been a lot of progress. This has been an area of attention for us as an association, sure. for all of our members for years. Uh, back in 2018, we began a series called Patients, Prejudice, and Policy. And we took a look at things that were occurring systemically that led to you know, differences in outcomes. One of the most important things are those social determinants of health, the non-medical, the non-health things that actually impact your health. Um, and as we know, and as we look at it, Really, from wealth comes health. And NGHA has stood up and has available uh, our vulnerable communities database. You can go in. We looked at 20 different criteria and ranked each and every zip code in New Jersey in terms of its vulnerability. Okay. Well, you you anticipated my, the, the next question, which was about um, the, the community, the, um, the social determinants. Before I get there, though, I just want to see, it, it, with, with regard to inequality, is there anything that that um, government at any level or any other institution, educational institutions, should be doing along those lines to try and to try and um, alleviate that that problem, or is it is it really just up to the hospitals themselves? Oh no, this is not something that hospitals are a piece of the solution. It's not something that they can drive. I think they can be leaders in it because they are really great at marshaling resources within a community. But we need government to weigh in. You know, we need all different sectors as well. Um, you take a look and you see the emerging importance of green spaces. And so you see how DEP, for example, is funding you know, green spaces. And, and we've seen that in some of our urban centers. But we need a, people to have a safe place to go and to exercise and to walk. We need to see the types of investments uh, that happen in housing. And we just recently saw St. Joe's open up their supportive housing in um in Patterson. Right. You know, we have a member that, that you know, hospital that's you know made a significant investment into something called buy local. And that's really to support local businesses. And they put in literally tens of millions of dollars to support minority owned, women owned and small businesses, three different categories. So they recognize again, wealth and health are inextricably tied. 
Okay, and and that that gets to to uh, again a related question, uh, a related issue, and that is again I hear over and over again hospital executives tell me they need to be out into the communities. They can't just sit behind the walls of the building. They need to be out there. They need to be closer to to the people that they're serving to prevent them from coming to the hospital in the first place. Is are those sorts of things happening across the board? I mean, I, I hear anecdotes and I hear stories here and there. I'm just curious as to as to how it sounds like your organization is also involved in it. How widespread is that kind of effort at this point? Oh, it's absolutely widespread. Every hospital in New Jersey is engaged in it. Um, to give you, you know, sort of, you know, a sense, you know, in addition, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, the care that they provide within the four walls of the hospitals, what we see our hospitals doing is providing free and discounted care. There was about $2 billion worth of that in 2020. We've seen you know, significant, uh, you know, about, you know, $43 million for community health improvement services. That's things like going out and doing health fairs and making sure that we're helping to monitor what some of the health um, impacts are. You know, so high blood pressure, what does it lead to? You need nutritious, you know, food. Let's help support a farmer's market. Uh, we have, uh, you know, other initiatives taking place. And I think, you know, we, we've spoken about some of them already. Okay. And in the background of all of this is the question of affordability. It's it's one of the main questions, one of the main issues that, that facing not only New Jersey, but the rest of the country. Um, what role do hospitals play in terms of uh, trying to make care more affordable for, for residents of New Jersey? Yeah, this is an incredibly complex issue, and I'm glad that well, you asked so, the Let's just solve it now, then. <laughs> because it's not one that has a simple solution. And there are a lot of sound bites out there at the moment. There's some finger pointing taking place. But one of the things that really surprises you know, me is that folks don't know that New Jersey, in terms of health care, care provided by hospitals, we're in about the middle of the pack in terms of affordability nationally. Okay. You know, I had people thinking we're, the, you know, we're, we're one of the most unaffordable places, and that's not the case. So you know, I think part of it is being educated and understanding that we've got this gigantic system of care that has the government involved as a payer, you have insurers, you have you know, medical devices, you have pharmaceuticals, you have you know, what's the role of primary care and the specialists, what's the role of hospitals, what's the role of all the post-acute providers, and that's just a piece of it. You know, we're not talking about technology, we're not talking about the supply chain. So there's a lot of components that drive into what do things cost. And that big conversation needs to take place because I think one of the things you'll hear from all industries is that we are committed to making sure that we've got this great healthcare, which New Jersey is known for, accessible, available, continue to focus on quality and continue to be available to all. Okay, well, the, the, um, the cost of hospitalization, hospitals, maybe one of the one, one few things, maybe the only thing that New Jersey is, is actually um, less expensive or more affordable than, than the rest of the country. Um, one one issue particularly important to business again, especially, and I promise we're going to talk about the future <laughs> before we leave. Um, coming out of the pandemic was was mental health. There was a, during the pandemic a lot of workers, a lot of employees were by themselves. They were, they were afraid. They were afraid for themselves, for their family. They were isolated. They were they. It, it was just a it was an unprecedented time for for most people. Um, and I know that that again, I've heard, I've talked to individual executives at, at hospitals about what they're doing again to 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 make mental health more accessible, to to reduce the stigma of seeking help. Again, statewide, from your perspective, how 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 are those efforts proceeding? How important is that? And and where are we at this point? These these efforts are critical at this point in time. We've seen you know, the increase of the burden of mental and emotional stressors in every business, in every setting, frankly, the schools as well. You saw what Governor Murphy recently did with the significant funding for schools to address it in students. On the business side though, what we're seeing you know, a growing need and it's self-identified. And you know, I think the employees are saying, we need to take care of this. Employers are saying, we need to take care of it. And so hospitals are playing a pretty big role because they're thinking about what are the programs, what are the services, what are the resources they can bring to bear. And so hospitals are looking at how can we integrate mental health into primary care? How can we integrate it into our chronic disease care? Um, how do we take care of the whole person, not just their physical health issue? 
Okay. And, and that's something that I don't think lots of patients or, or potential patients really, really think about it, right? I mean, mostly it's just, I'm sick, I'll go to the hospital, not I'm, I'm feeling weird, I'm feeling strange. I, I don't I don't like the way um, I'm, I'm sort of uh, processing the world. But so maybe there is some some help out there at, at, a, at, a, at a facility that I can or, or that I can access by telehealth or some other way. That's correct. Like you have that telehealth. And as a matter of fact, we're, we're working with our hospitals right now to stand up a pilot where we're going to sort of focus on, I think, small and medium sized businesses, just because, you know, large organizations, larger ones tend to have the resources to do it right. themselves. But to, you know, try and address, I think, within, you know, a business, some of the mental and emotional needs of, of their staff, of their team members. So we're going to be looking at doing things like how do you create a workforce mental health action plan? Or, you know, how do you start the conversation? Or maybe offering something like mental health first aid, which is something we currently do at NGHA for veterans. Okay, all right, that's interesting. So given all of that, and now we can look forward a little bit if you don't mind, um, given everything that we've talked about, and 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 if, if we haven't, if there are things we haven't talked about that you'd like to bring into this by all means, what are your priorities for the organization for the rest of the year and into 2024? What are the issues that, that you think are the most important that you're, you and, and, and hospitals have to deal with? You know, no, no two ways about it. It's going to continue to be this focus on workforce, workforce, workforce. It's the workforce of today, but it's also the workforce that we need for the future. Uh, that's got to be and will continue to be a significant priority for us. We want to make sure that we have the staff in place so New Jersey can continue to lead the country in quality care, quality accessible care. That's really at the heart of it. So I think, you know, that's going to be a big uh, area of focus. And then, of course, it wouldn't be a surprise to you, but we want to make sure that our hospitals remain here to care. And so we want to ensure that there is a stable you know, way to fund what hospital care is. And that sort of ties into that affordability conversation right. we had earlier. OK. All right. And before I let you go, um, I, what, what NJ Biz viewers, readers, may know or may not know is just the, the the contribution of hospitals to the state's economy. According to your website, uh, the hospitals employ 150,000 individuals, um, provide uh, almost $24 billion in job spending and other economic benefits to, to, to the state. What's your assessment of, of the of the future of the business, of the business side of it? Um, is consolidation over? Where is growth going to come from? Is it the aging population? What do you see and what do you hear from your members about, about what they're thinking the business is going to be like going forward? So I, I think that there are a lot of efficiencies that come from consolidation and there's some significant benefit to actually being very tight and embedded with your community our hospitals recognize that they are anchor institutions, just like a big university is. They mm -hmm. provide employment, they provide employment directly. They also provide it indirectly. You think, you know, the linens need to be cleaned, there's a job, you know, and there's right. another company. You know, food needs to come in. It doesn't have to come in from Sodexo and we're seeing that already. You know, sometimes it does, but there are other options, particularly, you know, provide to individuals that are inpatient. But I think in addition to that, as we start to look at hospitals, we're really cognizant that, you know, the population overall in New Jersey is aging. Uh, you know, all boomers are going to be 60 by 2030. So what that means is that we're all living a lot longer, we're all a lot healthier, sure. but we need to make sure our systems of care are set up so that, you know, while you're living and you have something that's a chronic condition, it's manageable and you're where you want to be at home, out with your friends and still, you know, hitting, you know, the basketball courts for your weekend for your game. Right. Okay. Well, you know, the, there's a reason why economic development folks talk about eds and meds as, as higher education and, and hospitals. And, and those are, are always anchor institutions and always um, a way to, to, to sort of bring economic development um, to, to, to areas oh, that need it. Absolutely. And, you know, we were really proud to recently partner with many industries and Rutgers as the lead pulling together a proposal uh, to the uh, U.S. EDA for a uh, grant to set up advanced uh, biopharma manufacturing um, here in New Jersey as a regional collaborative. We see the importance and we see the interconnectivity between the entire healthcare ecosystem, eds and meds. Okay, and and that's a good place to leave it. I hope you come back though and and give us an update on on where things are and and what kind of issues you're dealing with because this is fascinating. I'd love to, and thanks so much for having me today. Oh, well, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Kathy okay. Bennett, 
She's the president and CEO of the New Jersey Hospital Association. Thanks again. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Until next time, stay safe, everyone.